And this time we're going to turn it over to, uh, we're going to go to 11.0, the superintendent's update. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Little. Thank you, Madam Chair. As you can see um, beneath the superintendent update section of the agenda, there's, it's quite a robust agenda tonight. So I am just going to call our first person to come up and present. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, it's my privilege today to uh, well, I'm gonna have Mr. Salters welcome our, our, our guest. Go ahead, Mr. Salters, you, you welcome our guest, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Dr. Little. Um, members of the board tonight, I have uh, with me um, Mike Gallagher. He's for, with Compass Municipal Advisors. Mike, here's the clicker. He's going to give you a, uh, a brief uh, presentation on our um, uh, bond sale, or recent bond sale, and the outlook for our bond program. Um, as you know, we passed a um, bond referendum in 2018, um, and we, we've done our first major sale this past week, and Mike's been financial advisor with the district for a number of years, and um, Compass does a great job leading us through this, um, this operation. So, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Grab that microphone. It's still a pleasure to be here. Yes, it's sir. still a pleasure to be here. Um, we put together a little overview for you. Wanted to bring you up to speed. Last time I was with you was in February, and you know you had just passed the referendum. We were authorized in resolution for the issuance of the full three hundred sixty-five million dollars, and gave us the latitude and flexibility to look and see what your construction demands were and what market conditions were. And so, um, wanted to share with you some good news from the um, the transaction and. There we go. Okay, so we'll, we'll start looking at an overview of the issuance. Um, both, uh, we got the intercept rating, which is where the state of South Carolina guarantees the debt of the school district. They do that for all school districts in South Carolina. It had a AA1 rating from Moody's and a AA rating from Standard & Poor's. Um, the issuer credit rating, which is for the, for the school district, and that's as you stand on your own, is a, is a AA2 from Moody's, which is one notch below where the intercept rating is, and part of that's because the state of South Carolina has a triple A rating. And then you have a double A rating from Standard & Poor's, which is exactly the same as the intercept rating would be from the state. So that was very good. We sold these bonds on the 8th, last Tuesday. It's scheduled to close on the 29th of this month. It's a general obligation pledge, which means it's the full faith in credit and taxing power of the school district. And so they will levy enough to make sure that those payments are made. Um, the term of it was 25 years. Um, a couple things that are really interesting to note is, is the way the bids came in on it. We got nine bidders that bid on the transaction. Very happy to say for 25 years, we were able to borrow $165 million for 2.52%. It was insane. I mean, we had a great sale, very, very good rates. You'll see the other bids that were there. It wasn't like Bank of America Merrill Lynch missed the boat on it. You can look at those bids. They're packed in very, very tightly, and they give us a very, very good rate. Um, one of the things that happened with it is it was part of the way the bid was structured. We got a reoffering premium of approximately $15.4 million. Um, school districts are allowed to put that money into your project fund, something I wouldn't recommend spending today. I would say you're just getting going in your program, but I would set those dollars aside and look at Walk where us you are. Through that, Mr. Gallagher, just kind of in layman's terms, so we understand what a reoffering so. premium is. Yeah, you know, what it is is it's prepaid interest. It's mm -hmm. so the way the bonds are. Instead of like when you go finance your house, you get one rate on it, and so that two point five one nine is not just one single rate. Your $165 million was broken up into 25 individual little loans that mature each year. And in each of those, there's two different rates that we have to look at. One of those rates is the coupon rate. That is the rate that the school district is paying the investor. The yield is what the effective rate is. And so what we're looking at, that 2.51, that's what you're really effectively paying. That's what the investor gets. But the way the bids come in, we had 5% coupons out to um, the 10 year mark. And after that, we had some uh, two and a quarters and 3% coupons. And so we had very low rates. So, you know, in the past, you've, we brought issues to you for refunding. When these bonds become callable in 10 years, we're probably not going to be able to refund them. 
And that's a good thing because you got the savings on the front end. You don't have to do another transaction down the road. So very good. But you can take this premium, set it aside, and you know, look at where you are as you move through your program. You're just getting started. You may have cost overruns, or you may be able to bring everything in a budget, and then you would be able to not have to borrow quite as much money. And that's the way we've broken it out. Originally, we had, and we're going to show here in a minute, we originally had this set up for six transactions, six individual debt issuances. We were able to condense that down to four. Um, part of it was we pushed this bond issuance up because the market was very, very good. And we wanted to go ahead and lock in in today's rates. I, I don't know about y'all, but I don't know what in the world's going to happen in 2020. I don't know who's going to be running for president. I don't know what in the world that's going to have on financial markets. Are things going to be better or are they going to be worse? We don't know. But we know right now it's a good time. And so we sat down with uh, administration and talked through, here's where you are on your cash flow schedule, got updated schedules soon, looked at them, and we were able to push things up to be able to issue a little bit more at this time. Not going to have to do a bond anticipation note, maybe back up our issuance earlier next year and do it during the summer. Okay. Um, so this put a net deposit into the project fund of $93,729,778. And what we also did was we did a ban earlier this year. We did a bond anticipation note of $85 million, and we're going to pay that off when it matures on the 29th. It'll be paid off. Um, when I talked about the credit ratings, you see there um, AAA is the highest possible credit rating. Um, Y'all are just below that. The things that were noted in the report were the strengths, was the historical trend of balanced operations, the sizable... Um, and growing tax base and the strong reserves and liquidity position. All the, you know, two of those things are things that are within the control of this board and this administration. It is a credit to y'all for what you have done here for your fiscal strength. That's what translated into nine bids and translated into a very low rate. Um, the credit weaknesses, you can't do anything about the pension burden. That's outside of your control. And Act 388, we all know there's nothing that y'all can do about that either. But those are their two weaknesses. It's not bad when your weaknesses are things you can't do anything about, but you need to be proud of the good things that you have done to put yourselves in those positions. So every spring we go through a budgeting process where we struggle with how much to keep in the fund balance, essentially. So can you talk through you know, where our fund balance was with respect to this bond insurance and if it prepared as well and helped us with those rates? I, I can't speak exactly to where you are, but when you see when you see where it says strong reserves and liquidity position, that helped you immensely. That puts you into that top tier. I can get for y'all a copy of Moody's rating scorecard, and you can see quantifiably where that puts you, um, if that's information that y'all would like. But yes, the, the fund balance being at a good, strong level, that is very helpful. If I might take a point of privilege, since I've served on the board so long, um, Mr. Butler and Mr. Salters and that whole team in the finance department, they are so committed to that fund balance. And then now Dr. Little has joined that commitment. And it, that's kind of a hard thing to explain out in the public because it, it's, um, it's money that if something were to happen, it's rainy day funds, we call it. And but, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. when we saw the economic downturn in 2008, we saw a lot, of, a lot of my clients had to go issue tax anticipation notes. They had to do something. That is something that Lexington One has not done that I can recall as long as I've been in this business. No. And they, they are so committed to the fiscal, um, just the smartness. Responsible. Very fiscal responsible. responsible responsibility. But I want to thank Jeff and, and Mr. Butler and, and their team because that, that has been a long-range vision, and I'm glad Dr. Little's joined on that vision as well. So it's exciting. Well, and, and Ms. Smith, I think that you crediting um, Jeff and then uh, Mr. Butler, good credit and good fiscal responsibility isn't something that happens in one year. It's a long-term yeah. investment in making good decisions and wise planning and wise management. Uh, so I think that's a credit to everyone out there that works in our finance department. Exactly. And we, and we took time this summer of had an opportunity that we had the analysts from Moody's Investor Service were here. They were in the state in June. And, you know, I had them come and sit down and meet with, you know, Dr. Little and Jeff and, and John before he um, retired. So, yeah, I mean, it's very important. And they, they note that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay. Um, moving right along, this is just a graphical representation showing what your debt looks like. Um, everything that's in the, the royal blue color is uh, just the outstanding general obligation bonds, and you've got some others. I think the two things to key on is the lighter blue color. That is your referendum program, and we've sized everything out. When we said 25 years, your next issue that's going to be done next year, it's going to be done for 24. We're just going to try to sync everything up where it all matures at the same time. Um, we did move taxes from 85.3 to 90 mils this past year, and according to the plan would be to go to 95 next year and then to 99, depending upon how these transactions work and as the debt issuances go and the needs of the district, what your, what your facility needs are. So that's what, sort of where the plan is. Um, have things tagged to go out to um, as we get into 2029, 2030, and then you'll see that there is a substantial drop there. Um, that way, if there is a need for more facilities, if the area continues to grow as it has been, then you will have capacity there that we should be able to fit that into your next program. Um, so speaking a little bit more about the 2018 referendum, $365 million approved by the voters. Um, as I told you before, we originally had six transactions scheduled. Um, happy to say now we're down to four. We cut two of them out. We're not going to have to do a bond anticipation unless there's some changes to your construction cash flow schedule. That's what drives everything. What the needs of the district are and trying to make sure that above all else that there's money there to pay the invoices when they come in from the contractors. You know, it's good that y'all were in a position that you had projects ready to go and you're able to go ahead and get them locked in. But as I said about that premium earlier, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done and you don't know where those projects are gonna come in and we don't know what the rates are gonna be. We're looking at next year having an issuance of $150 million. It could be pushed up a little more depending on the needs or it could be pulled back. It really depends on two things. We're really gonna be driven by one, what the needs of the district are, and the second will be looking at market conditions. I may take a point of privilege on that because I see, Mr. Salter, some of your construction people are here tonight, and uh, the fact that they have identified prototypes for our schools, um, I, you cannot, it saves our constituents so much money. It also makes it easy to go, we, we, we hit the ground running. And we have a building design, and it's ready to go. And um, it's so exciting to see these prototypes going up across the district, which are basically the same schools. They're just cited for that land and for the needs of that particular school. So I want to thank you all for making that a reality. Uh, we don't have anything else on this. Um, other th next page is, your, is the debt service structure report. And that just really gets to the math behind the graph for all of the bond issues that you have outstanding. The thing I really want to bring your attention to is column J. Um, you know, when we did a $365 million referendum program, and I remember the numbers that John had me run, we were well over 400 million at times. And we know that the list of needs was really close to 400 million. There was a lot of things that were cut out. And one of the things that was uh, done was making sure that we had money within the annual maintenance or annual issuance area. Very happy to say, as of right now, we've got about $5,250,000 each year that would be available for y'all to use to cover some of those HVAC routes, all of the things that were not a part of the referendum, that you have that, that's within your 8% authority, and that's something that you can, you know, you can budget, and I'm sure these are all things that you have in your capital program already. It's not as if you can go out and add a whole bunch of new projects to it. Um, but the, you know, those were things that were all within your program. And that $5 million, um, like if we use none of it in 2021, then 2022, we have $10.5 million? No, it's going to be a one-time. Uh, okay. It'll be one-time. It's what it Basically what it does is we've solved out for the millage, and if you did not issue it, then the taxes would drop. Okay. Okay, so it's not something that's just going to be like a recurring revenue stream that you could plan on. Very short term, it would be something that you would borrow. We have the issuance going, um, I believe, in two weeks that it will be sold and closed in early November, and it will be paid off in March. Okay. Okay. And the last thing is just a, a little fun. Congratulations. Yeah, that's exciting. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Board, are there any questions or comments from Mr. Gallagher or Mr. Salters? 
So I, I had read, um, I actually was able to find the article about the journal. They talked about um, the flipping of muni, of muni bonds, basically by the buyers of these. Is, is there, does that happen? Do we? district would be concerned about or worried about. Okay. I mean, it's okay. nothing that, you know, once you sell them, we sell these in the primary market. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch bought it. They either parked it into institutional accounts. They had, I mean, the way, that, the way the process works, we sell it in the primary market to an underwriter. That underwriter, then his job is to find homes or investors for the paper. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then um, as far as the, the reoffering premium, does that money just sit in an escrow account? or That money is going to go into your project fund. So okay. that money is going to go into the project fund when it's deposited on the 29th. It's going to go to the state tre to the county treasurer's office, and they're going to invest it over in what's known as the state treasurer's LGIP. And so that is about the best rate you can get right now for full liquidity. It's a better rate than what you're going to get from the bank. Part of the reason is, is because the state treasurer has – uh, a different set of investment criteria. One of the things he's able to invest in is commercial paper, and that gets a slightly higher rate. Gotcha. Okay. I do want to clarify something. You, your advice would be though to let it sit for the time being until we get further into the bond referendum program. Is that what you, I heard you say earlier? Yes, sir. I, I would say you want to take, see where you are as you move through your program. We don't know where. You, number one, we don't know. We don't have all the projects locked down on cost. They may get into a situation when you're going into a renovation and your contractor comes to you and say, well, we're in here. We're already tearing up the ceiling. We're already tearing up the lights. This HVA system needs to be replaced. It would be really good that you had those dollars set aside that you could use them for something like that if it were to come up. Um, but you're very early in your program, and I would say it would be best to, to sit and, you know, as you move through it. And I assume it, the funds can only be used for the original terms of the bond referendum. Correct. correct. You could only use that money for referendum projects, or you could use it to defease a portion of the debt. I have a client that right now is going through the process of using it to defease the debt. Any other questions or comments, board? I have a question for Mr. Salters. Um, we keep hearing about the prototypes saving us money. Do we know exactly how much money we're saving with the prototypes? Uh, we don't have a, an exact dollar figure. Um, I think the the ability for us to pull forward some of the borrowing, the original schedule, um, had it had us borrowing a smaller chunk of money. Being able to pull that um, forward into the program is an example of how this has saved us money. Um, built more interest in the, in the sizing because it was a $165 million issue. Um, so that $15 million premium, you know, could have been eight. It could have been 10. You know, it's, it's hard to put a, a factor on that. Um, but what we do know is that um, every year we're seeing inflationary costs, um, and that's built into our referendum about 4%. Um, and so we're, we're seeing those numbers come up. And so you, you add that on top of premiums like that, um, and the savings can be pretty significant. Thank you. Um, and if I could, Ms. Smith, if I could just take a minute. I, I'd like to, uh, you guys have acknowledged the staff, but I really would like to point out, um, you know, Deborah Seymour uh, took over basically a lot of this work related to um, the bonds and, and capital project stuff. Um, and, you know, Dina Bishop retired. We all talk about uh, Mr. Butler, but Dina Bishop retired, and that was her primary role um, and Deborah stepped right in and and you know prepared all the documents and has really done an outstanding job working um, with um, our bond attorney and, and Mike getting getting up to this point so um, and then the other finance staff has been there supporting uh, all the needs as well and of course uh, Mr. Stamire, Mr. Warren over there um, you know really making it all happen on the ground um, if we can get the money, they can find a way to, to spend it efficiently. So um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate um, all the hard work that they do. Thank you, Mr. Salters. Well, let's give these teams a round of applause. Right. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, next on our uh, agenda, uh, Ms. Green, you have a uh, brief update for us, I believe, for the regional meeting. Um, yes. Actually, uh, was it two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. Two weeks ago. Was it two weeks ago? It's been October is like all a blur. Um, 
Ms. Smith and Mr. Anderson and Mr. Oswald and I attended the Dr. Little. and Dr. Little attended the um, school board association's um, regional advocacy meeting. They have five of those um, in the fall um, in different locations around the state to kind of, um, I guess, galvanize the troops uh, to get ready for the legislative session and just to talk about some of the things that are coming on the horizon um, with the education bill. And um, even though there's kind of, we've kind of the House and Senate, South Carolina House and Senate have been in summer recess, they've actually been meeting and ha I mean, they're continuing to work. And so they just, um, they get us together and make us aware of what's coming around the bin um, on very important topics to us and what we need to um, be prepared for and be ready to advocate for. Um, Mike, did you have any thoughts about that? And then um, actually last week, just I'm gonna mm -hmm. dovetail on that. Last week, um, Mr. Anderson and I also attended um, a school board association beyond the basics training, which was uh, titled From Conflict to Collaboration. Um, and it was an excellent presentation um, with a um, like a life coach from a Columbia a retired military. He'd been in the military for 30 something years um, and just talking about, um, you know, working collaboratively. You know, we, we tell our that's one of our, you know, things that we teach the students. Um, and it's so important for us to um, work on that and um, work well with each other and model it for our children because um, really they they learn more from what they see than what they hear. Um, and so it's been a busy few weeks of um, professional learning for the board. Um, and so that we encourage everybody to participate if you can. Um, if y'all ever have any questions, all the stuff is on the School Board Association website. Anybody can look at it. Um, there's always some great handouts and some training materials out there. Um, but I personally am eager for the legislative session to get going again uh, so that we can see where they're going with the education bill. Um, the, the funding um, plan from Frank Rainwater, the Revenue and Fiscal Affairs site, um, came out last week and it was a very interesting um, document. I think Dr. Little has perused that and um, it's not quite what we thought they were going to create. Um, so we've got some things coming around the bend that we may need to um, ask your help for and contacting our local legislators because um, school funding in South Carolina is broken and we need to fix it and I think it's going to take everybody, parents, um, teachers, administrators, community members that don't have children um, to participate in that advocacy. So. Thank you very much, Ms. Green. Can I just say one quick thing? That, that meeting was held in Lexington 4 at the um, Early Childhood Learning Center which was so neat for our board because I, I think was that was that y'all's first was, time yes. going to that market? I mean, it's amazing what they're doing over there with the three and four and five year olds. And as you know, part of our bond referendum, we're going to be building two early childhood learning centers uh, that will be very similar to that site. So it was really neat for us to go in a building that's dedicated to that and see what our, you know, how that wants to dovetail with our vision. So that part was exciting too. And I was going to make, um, I did um, highlight one thing that was um, stated when we were at the um, School Board Association advocacy thing um, was that um, this past year with the teacher pay raise, that budget writers, um, their analysis has shown that that teacher raise in 2019 was the largest teacher pay raise in 35 years in South Carolina. Um, and so that's significant and it's also kind of pitiful that it <laughs> took 35 years to get a, you know, a substantive raise for our teachers. Um, and hopefully that's just the phase one of ongoing um, attention to teacher pay in our state because that's really the way that we're going to um, get and retain uh, great teachers. Thank you very much. Uh, it is now my privilege and pleasure to welcome Dr. Shane Phillips um, to give us, he's going to do us a, uh, give us a data update, and give us a synopsis of um, some of the things that we can expect. Or still not on there. There it is. Okay. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to provide you with our uh, annual accountability update. Um, we're going to start with what's been in the media recently, which is our state report cards. Um, before I 
talk too much about results. I want to give you a little bit of context and a little bit of history about these uh, documents that are produced yearly now by the state. Uh, so prior to the 2017-18 school year, um, there was a brand new report card design that was practically not used at all. It, it didn't provide a lot of ratings. It didn't. It just provided sort of some outline of information about the progress of a school. It did not provide any kind of rating or um, grade for a school. Also during that time, there, were, there was a change, a pretty major change made to our SC Ready test, and that was the addition of what's called the TDA, the Text Dependent Analysis, which um, there's always been a writing prompt on that test. Uh, this was a, sort of a, a shift in the content of that test and caused a shift in our instruction as well. What that, and just briefly, what that uh, entails is uh, a writing prompt that requires a student to refer to a piece of text and be able to support an argument that they write about with examples from the text. So in the past, the, the writing prompts had been kind of um, superficial and s sort of simple. Um, this took it sort of to a whole other level. Then in the beginning with the 2017-18 school year, the EOC uh, redesigned the accountability system sort of as part of the whole process that had been gone on before and designed a brand new report card. Um, that report card has several components, which I'll go over in a second. Uh, one of those components is a student progress measure, which was a value add measure by a um, SAS process out of North Carolina called EVOS. Um, and it basically provided a measure of certainty about whether or not a school uh, went up or down in any given year. It didn't tell you how much they went up or down. It just said, we're pretty certain they went up or we're pretty certain they went down. Another change that was made at that particular time was that adult ed prior, when a kid transferred from adult ed or to, from a high school to an adult ed institution, they were allowed to be excluded from the grad rate calculation. With this school year, that um, exclusion was eliminated. So statewide, you saw a little bit of a drop in graduation rate that year because those students were now included in the school's graduation rate cohort. The next thing that happened was that same text-dependent analysis process was added to the English 1 in the course test, which threw a whole wrinkle into that test. And then what they did was they alternated grades for science and social studies. In the past, we had given science and social studies to grades 3 through 8, both. Now, it had, they had done a few things differently prior to that, one of them being at one point they took half of each grade and gave half of those kids science and half of them social studies. The goal of all of that being twofold. One, reduce testing. Two, save money, okay, on producing those materials by the state. In the 2017-18 school year, what they decided to do was give science in grades four, six, and eight, and social studies in grades five and seven nothing in grade three except for reading and math, okay, which made it difficult to gauge progress over years as you, as you look at, at, you know, how do students do in social studies in this year compared to this year? Well, we can't really do that now because those same kids didn't take that same test. So you can't really look at growth there on that. Then this past year, uh, that EVOS measure that they used for student progress um, was put out for uh, another bid by the state, and so they changed that, and a company called Education Analytics got that contract. And the process and calculation of that metric is completely different. And if I'm being completely transparent, it hasn't been explained to me in a way that I understand yet. Um, so I do know that it's different because it's, 
it's not what they were doing with Evos. Um, I finally got my head wrapped around that, and now it changed. So uh, when I figure it out, I'll be sure to let you guys know. <clears throat> and then, so that's where we are now, is in this whole part here. Um, but what's coming up are some further changes, all right? So you see where I'm going with this. It, it becomes difficult each year to compare a report card from one year to the next, all right? But coming up next year, there is a proviso now that's um, purportedly for one year only, and that is to eliminate all social studies testing for one year with the goal of saving money, okay? We will see if that lasts for one year. Um, also, we're transitioning in the high schools from an English 1 end of course test to an English 2 end of course test. So at this point, some kids will be taking English 1 for accountability. Some kids will be taking English 2 for accountability this year. Um, and there's a whole, um, Erica can testify to this, there's a very complex sort of flow chart that goes with what counts for whom and that kind of thing. So this is, this is a little bit of a, a adjustment for our, our high schools. And then finally, next year, the report cards have to be made available by September 1st. Oh, that would be great for us. It will be great for us. Um, it does put the state under the gun, so it puts um, a lot of stress. The state's putting a lot of stress well, on luckily, getting that. Luckily, the state's real good at following its own rules. So, well, so. sure. <laughs> we got them. When did we, what was the date that they were unembargoed this year? October uh, 1st. Okay. You're going that to was, by that. law, they had to be done by October 1st this year. Mm -hmm. September 1st There's next year. A whole, year. okay. We'll see if it happens. Yep. We'll see. Okay. So, again, let's talk about what goes into these report cards. First of all, actually, let me go back here because it's important that we look at it kind of in this context. Um, when this report card system was being designed, the, the point or the, the premise on which they were being designed was to provide a sort of comprehensive look at schools based on the South Carolina profile of a graduate, okay, which is a kind of a big holistic global look at schools. Um, what came about was something a little bit different. Um, so there are several components, and they are a little bit different for elementary, middle, and then high school. So for elementary and middle, you have these components. You have student achievement, which, and we'll, I'm going to give you the points for a school that has more than 20 English language learners, because that's the majority of our schools. Student achievement's worth 35 points. That's based off of South Carolina Ready, ELA, and math. Preparing for success is worth 10 points. That's based off of science and social studies on SC Pass. Student progress, also based off of the SC Ready, ELA, and Math, is worth 35 points. The progress of ELL students is worth 10 points, and that's based off the results of the WIDA Access Assessment. And then school quality, which is based off of a self-reported student engagement survey given to every kid, grades 3 through 12. Okay? Um, so that's for elementary and middle, which means that at elementary and middle school, 90% of the 100 points that you can get come from standardized tests, which takes us back to the prior accountability system, which was based almost completely on standardized, well, completely on standardized tests. We get 10% off of a self-reported survey now. Um, for high school, there is no student progress, which, I will talk about a little bit more when we talk about end of course scores. Um, so you get 35 points for student achievement, 10 points for preparing for success. So the student achievement comes from your end of course scores in algebra and English. Your uh, preparing for success comes from biology and US history. Um, you get 10 points for ELL progress. You get 10 points for school quality. And then there's a college and career readiness. College career readiness is probably the closest the state came to doing this global look. Um, they did, but, but it also includes SAT scores, ACT scores, uh, ready-to-work assessment scores, 
um, professional certifications, the ASVAB tests. So you can see the majority of those things that you can get college and career readiness endorsement for are standardized tests. So again, at the high school, the vast, vast majority of your points come from standardized tests. The only one that doesn't, only two that don't, are the school quality worth 10 points and the graduation rate worth 25. All right, so those are the components of the report card. Given all that and the differences between years, here are our 2019 report card ratings. 11% uh, of our schools are below average, 43 average, 21% excellent, and 25% good. All right, so now we'll just quickly go through our, our assessment results so that you can see how we did on each of these individual assessments. Um, first, SC Ready. Again, this is ELA and math grades three through eight. So here I've provided you with the state results and the district results. So he, these first two are ELA with the state and district here. And this is math with the state and district here. As you can see, if we just look at these top two chunks, which are the percent of our students meeting or exceeding standard, we surpass the state in both ELA and math. And if you look down here at the very bottom little chunk, that's our students who do not meet standard and, and that excludes the approaches. So again, our not met percentages are lower than that of the state. Sir? And, and Dr. Phillips, this grading algorithm of exceeds, meets, approaches are not met is not risk stratified based upon anything. So not no. your percent of free or reduced lunch or? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. <laughs> all right, so since our kids in grades three through eight all take this test each year, it's, um, I've provided you with some change over time here. So um, again, here's the state percent meeting or exceeding and the district's percent meeting or exceeding. We're up 3.4% in ELA and up almost a percent in math. Um, and I think this is, this is a testament to the hard work we've done with the student engagement model in those two content areas. Yes, sir. Is the state moving at all as well? Because again, the whole purpose of this is obviously- The state the did increase a little bit. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. So this is, since now the state provides us with um, percentile ranks based on the state uh, performance, we can kind of look at how these scores are distributed. So as you can see, our sort of, our median score, our median percentile rank is right below the 60th percentile across the board in ELA and in math. So you can see how those scores are distributed across the district. Yes, sir. Do you have any insight into the districts that are either at the either end of the state? I mean, I guess you don't know where other districts are, like the district that's up I, at the 100 versus the district that's at the zero? I can tell you, I, well, I do know who those are. Yeah. Um, not off the top of my head, but I have that all plotted. I do know that what you see distribution-wise is that it follows poverty lines pretty closely. Mm -hmm. So the higher the poverty, the lower the, the score. Nothing new there. All right, SC Pass, again, is science and social studies, science given to grades four, six, and eight, and social studies given to five and seven only. Okay, so again, if you look at the top two chunks, we do pretty well here in science compared to the state. You'll notice a little bit different here. It's because social studies is only rated on three levels. Um, they were actually working to get this coming year to get it on the same sort of scale as everything else but they're not doing it next year, so we're, we're at three here. So four levels here, we're doing fine, and here again, we're surpassing the state as well. And again, it makes no sense to look at a comparison over last year. Just know that our uh, percent meeting or exceeding is greater than that of the state. Um, end of course. Tests, Algebra 1, English 1, Biology and U.S. History. Um, this is just the letter grade distribution. Again, the first bar is the state and the second bar is the district. And as you can see, we surpass 
the state in algebra one on A's, B's, C's, and D's, and then we do better on the, the percent of students failing. Um, and then on English one, we have, again, the same story, better on A's, B's, and C's, fewer D's, and fewer F's. Okay, so in biology, same story, a good many more A's, B's, C's, about the same amount of D's, and dramatically fewer F's. And then in uh, U.S. history, again, a great many more A's and B's, more C's, slightly fewer D's, and dramatically fewer F's. And this is just the distribution, so you can kind of see which, which tests overall we do better in. Uh, we do best in English 1 here, followed by, um, biology, oh, excuse me, followed by U.S. history, then by biology, then by algebra 1. So the line here in the middle is the median, and the diamond is the average score. The red dots are outliers, outlier scores, just individual student scores. So what you probably have here are kids that didn't test and received a zero on the test. And this is just a, a kid that didn't do too, too well, somewhere. So this is the, uh, this is the 25th percentile, 75th percentile. 50th percentile and the mean, and then this is the minimum disregarding outliers, minimum and maximum. I know a few years ago it was kind of a national thing where parents were opting the kids out of taking the test. Still would, a thing. It is like how many did we have opt out this year? Is it uh, down the numbers? I, I don't have that off the top of my head. It was maybe a handful. Okay. A handful. Um, did you see it in any, was there a pattern at, any, uh, at schools or just kind of a, a, just a scattering? It's, across it's a scattering, okay. really. It's, it's here and there. Um, at that one, at that time that you're talking about, it was kind of clustered in one particular area. Yeah. It's not now. It's just kind of a little bit everywhere. Okay. Yes, sir. So, Yes, we, I mean, we, we have discussed in length. In fact, we had a meeting yesterday where we talked about, um, you know, making sure that we're addressing the needs of all students on these things. So we look at gaps uh, between different demographics um, to make sure that we're providing opportunities for those kids to, to succeed in those tests, which should lead to those minimums coming up, that maximum staying at 100 and, you know, squishing down that distribution into something that is more attractive. Right. Correct. That's correct. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's talk about AP and SAT. Um, okay, so two lines here. This is advanced placement, so AP test. Down here at the bottom is the percent of high school students taking at least one AP test. Okay, so as you can see, two years ago, we were at 16%. Then we were at 18%. Then we were at 19%. So... As, as we increase the, participa the participation rate in these classes, you can see that the passing rate is staying relatively stable. Okay, as we're encouraging these kids to go into these higher rigor courses, um, people might estimate that these, would, these scores would kind of drop precipitously, but they're staying relatively stable. So you can see that now we have almost one in five kids in high school taking at least one AP course and 63% of those kids are getting a three to five score on those, on at least one of those tests. Finally, we're gonna talk about SAT. So at, in the state, yes, sir. No, it's, it's cool. So this is actually all high school students. So we, we have about 7,000 a little okay. more than 7,000 kids. Oh, okay. So um, this oh, is like 1,400 kids. It's per year taking one AP class in that's that year. That's correct, yes. Sir. Oh, okay. Wow, that's even better. That's even, even a better. lot more that's, kids. That's now. about 1,400 kids taking those. 
All right, so here we are with SAT. So this is participation. Now, again, one of the changes that was made, I didn't note it on the timeline, I should have, is that last year kids had a choice of whether or not to take the ACT or the SAT, okay? This is our graduating senior report. So this doesn't necessarily reflect uh, that decision uh, last year, but what we can say with certainty is that from our graduating seniors, 67% of those kids took the SAT compared to 57% at the state level. Okay, so a great, you know, two thirds of our kids are taking the SAT test. Um, and when you look at national comparisons, you guys know that there are a lot of states where that percentage is dramatically lower, okay? Um, so if we look down here at the scores, this first bar is the nation, uh, the second bar is the state, and the third bar is our district. And as you can see in reading, math, and then obviously in composite, we surpass both the nation and the state. So that's, that's some good news there. Okay, so that is my report. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any further questions you guys have. All right. I just, oh, I yes, ma'am. Um, in Pillion, three of their four schools are rated below average, and they're the That's only correct. schools in the district. Has there been any talk about addressing that problem? So, yes, ma'am. It is certainly a problem. Any time a school doesn't perform where we feel like they should it is certainly something that we need to that we address. And so we, look, we take a really deep look at instructionally what's happening at um, test scores at the environment, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, we certainly know that, that there are things that across the district that we have to address. Um, but, and that, that's no different in Pelion than it is anywhere else. But yes, ma'am, we, we do look at that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Nicely done, Dr. Phillips. And next on our list, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, if you would come forward, please. Um, we, uh, as you know, we are to receive quarterly updates from uh, White Knoll Middle School. And um, I think they, you actually have some really good news for us. Shane purposefully did not say anything about it because we wanted to give you an opportunity to, to, to brag on your school a little bit. So, Mr. Smith, welcome. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. We may. Uh, there you go. And uh, thank you, Dr. Talley, members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to, to come back and share with you again. Uh, as you're aware, our priority status uh, was based on the 2018 uh, school report card. Uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the information that, that Dr. Phillips shared to, to put that in some perspective, and particularly as it relates to uh, the, uh, the student progress metric that was in, in the previous year's report card. I was extremely happy to, to hear that he didn't understand that one either totally, so made me feel a little better uh, about that. Uh, the, uh, I guess the most important bit of news to share this evening uh, is our, the bottom line on our school report card that, that came out uh, October 1st. Uh, we rose uh, two levels on the report card to average uh, this year. And, and while obviously in, in Lexington one or anywhere else, uh, average is generally not what we celebrate and certainly not what we aspire to, uh, it does represent, I believe, a, a much better uh, measure of, of who we are and, and where we are. And certainly, as you saw from some previous information, it puts us uh, much in line with a number of our sister middle schools and also our feeder elementary schools. So uh, we were happy to celebrate that with our faculty this month. Uh, not going to go through all those parts of the report card with you, but uh, as Shane pointed out, there are four area, five areas that uh, points come to schools on the report card. Uh, four of those five areas uh, we went up on, on this year's report card, uh, including academic achievement slightly, uh, English learners progress, which we were very proud of. One of the things that contributed to that uh, through support of senior leadership and the board we uh, added a, an ESOL teacher to our staff this past year due to our growing numbers uh, of those students. And we also made some changes in how we were providing support for those students. 
So we were excited about that. Uh, student progress uh, due, I believe, mainly to the, the changing of, of metrics and the measurement of that made a, a very significant move. And uh, we also uh, had some growth in student engagement points. There was a slight dip uh, in the, uh, the other measure, which was connected to a, a slight dip in social studies scores, which again, those students change from year to year who are taking the test. So excited to bring that news to you. Uh, really more excited to, to talk to you about some of the things going on at Widenall Middle School. And, and by the way, we look forward to you guys uh, visiting with us uh, next Friday so uh, we can share in person some of what's going on and our students can, can speak to you about that as well. Uh, as you may remember, we were one of the middle schools who made a significant change in our schedule this year. Uh, and we are now running a schedule in which our four core classes of language arts, math, science, and social studies are approximately 65 minutes in length. Uh, we moved world language to a third uh, academic connections route along with our other exploratory courses and fine arts courses. And consequently, our core teachers now are teaching uh, four classes a day uh, rather than five, as they did in the past. Uh, they have a common grade level planning time, which is fairly significant. Uh, I think it's important. One of the things, in addition to pay, that teachers have talked about a lot is the opportunity for good common planning time and extended planning time. Our new schedule allowed us to do a better job of that. Our academic connections teachers now teach six classes a day, but their planning time is equal to our core teachers' planning time. So we're excited about this and particularly excited that in, in those core subjects and especially language arts and math, our teachers have more time with students and actually less students during the course of a day. And we, uh, we believe that's going to provide some, some other growth and impact there. Uh, we are also working, as, as most schools are, on moving away from a, a pullout model uh, in special ed, RTI, and ESOL, and moving more to a push-in model. Uh, we still have some pullout classes in all three of those areas where we serve students who really need some intensive support. Uh, in resource or RTI or ESOL, but most of our students in those areas are being served by a resource RTI or ESOL teacher pushing in to their regular ed language arts or math class. And we believe that uh, provides them support they need uh, when they need it, and, and they can really get on target with support for those students. Uh, as, as Dr. Phillips alluded to, we, we also believe much of our growth and, and success of our students is connected to implementing uh, the workshop model or student engagement model, uh, particularly in language arts and math. And, and the growth there is, is due to some super teacher work, students doing a super job. Uh, our literacy and math coaches are doing an awesome job coaching up our teachers uh, and, and great support uh, from instruction. Uh, particularly from uh, Dr. Bissell in language arts and Ms. Morgan in math. So we, we believe that all the way down the line that is, is truly changing how we uh, instruct in those areas. The students are more engaged, they're doing more reading, they're doing more hands-on math, and, and that's going to move their learning. Uh, because of our status, as you know, we received some additional funding from the state. And uh, we'll talk about a few of the things that that allowed us to do this past year. Uh, so while we were not happy about the status, we were, of course, uh, excited to have some, some funding that we were able to do some, uh, some neat things with. Uh, a, a significant portion of that funding allowed us to add a math instructional coach uh, to our instructional support. Uh, we, like other middle schools, already had a literacy coach who was doing a, an excellent job and a digital literacy coach who was supporting our teachers. Uh, we now have a math coach on board uh, who we actually hired from within. Uh, Tiffany Scholl was one of our former teachers of the year and former math and science teacher. Uh, she, through our interview process, she came out on top and we, we made a, a very good decision putting her on board. She's doing these things uh, among a number of others. She is doing coaching cycles with our teachers. We've worked on increasing uh, classroom support, both through uh, things that our teachers have like manipulatives, uh, she's working with our teachers on planning and doing uh, observations and feedback and also helping the rest of us better understand what's going on in our math classes. So we're very excited about the work there. Uh, we also use part of that funding to uh, 
along with, with some of what was mentioned earlier, of beefing up our classroom libraries in language arts. Uh, we purchased this past summer about $30,000 worth of books for our classroom libraries. Uh, we're going to continue some of that work. Also, our PTSA is, is working with us to, uh, to beef that up as well. So lots more books in student hands and, and a lot more student reading going on, we, we believe. Uh, another part of our funding went to uh, setting up some particular trainings for our math teachers. Uh, we recognized, as, as many of us across the district did, that we particularly needed to do some more work in the area of math instruction. So among other things, along with the instructional coach, we've also scheduled some uh, math uh, trainings on site uh, with Mr. Fred Dillon, who works with the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Uh, we've had one of those sessions so far and we have two more coming up uh, within the next few months. Uh, one of the, the really neat things we did this summer, we, we chose to use part of our funding to do an in-house summer school, summer enrichment program. Uh, we selected uh, 25 students who otherwise, these were rising seventh and eighth graders, uh, or actually about not to be rising seventh and eighth graders. Uh, who would have otherwise had to be uh, do summer school or possibly retained. Uh, we set up a program of uh, four weeks of some pretty intensive stuff uh, and a lot of engaging stuff. We work particularly on ELA, math, study skills, and interpersonal skills. And I'm happy to say that all 25 of those students made it through our program and were promoted. Uh, we are following them throughout the course of the year, uh, hooked them up with some uh, staff people to mentor them and keep up with them. Uh, right now, as you might imagine, it's kind of a mixed bag. Some of them are doing much better. Uh, some are doing somewhat better, and some we are still working on. But uh, that, I think, uh, kind of speaks for itself, because last year this time, pretty much 25 of them were not doing very well. So we, we're going to follow those folks, and we also plan to do this again this coming summer. And how, how did you fund that? Uh, this was funded with the state priority funding money. And did they uh, provide transportation funding as well? We uh, we provided, uh, we had four teachers who worked with us on this, uh, so provided the salaries for those teachers. Uh, we worked with uh, transportation to provide transportation to pick, pick the students up every day and take them home. Uh, we worked with food service, and we did lunch every day uh, through our food service program, and we also, we obviously bought some materials and, and those kind of things. And we also did a couple of pretty neat field tri trips. The uh, coolest one was to uh, McIntyre uh, Joint Air National Guard Base, which, uh, okay. yeah. So uh, re re really highly engaging for these students. And, and we think it helps some of them particularly kind of reconnect to learning and, and, and reconnect to what was important about being at school. A uh, little update going forward, we have, have submitted, uh, I guess end of September, our uh, application for funding for this coming year with the priority funding money. And these are the, the categories we're going to use it for. Uh, we're going to continue to fund our math instructional coach. Uh, so that's a pretty big chunk for salary and benefits. Uh, we're going to uh, do the summer enrichment program again because, again, we felt that was, was highly impactful for a, a pretty good group of students. Uh, we are going to begin the process of becoming an, an AVID school. Uh, we are uh, really fortunate that we have a, a couple of folks on board with us currently, uh, both of our assistant principals. Uh, Margaret Schillett has worked with AVID in Richland too, and Lakeisha Cook joins us, and she is actually an AVID trainer. So we have some, some on-site folks who already have some background in that. Uh, Carolina Springs became a site this year, so we're going to uh, kind of piggyback on some of their, their learning as we go through the process. And so we look forward to beginning that process, getting some of our folks trained in that summer institute and working towards that for uh, next school year. Uh, in addition, we're going to use some of the funding to continue to grow our classroom libraries and also work on materials for our math classrooms. Um, so that's that's kind of our update of where we are. Any, any questions? Um, in the hospital, we have to deal with um, all kinds of quality metrics and uh, and the nuances of that. Um, so I hope we're taking again the state report card. We can argue about the pros and cons, 
but it is one way to have a measuring stick such that these interventions we can decide um, at the student level. So those 25 students, I would hope that they perform better year over year. Um, and you can almost back into a value equation. So, you know, 20% improvement for a 10% cost, whatever the numbers played out to be. And then the same, for example, the math coaching and or the, teach, so the, the teachers that engage that instructional um, re-education or additional education, how, how did those students move? And so I'm sure we're analyzing that at a district level because obviously if it works for one school, then we can start targeting the other schools to bring that distribution because my guess is that mean will start moving up if that bottom 10% can just be pulled up into the fold. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm sure that work's yeah, happening. I, I don't even know it as a well, board member. Well, the, the, the challenge, and I'll say this. What, what did, so we went last year when we found out that White Knoll Middle School received an unsatisfactory grade, you and I had a conversation. You, do you recall that conversation? Absolutely. What did I say to you then? You told me that. I don't remember your exact words, but you told me we were more concerned about what students were doing, concerned about our progress, and that that didn't define us. You you understood where those numbers were coming from. Yeah. Th th again, I, I, I do want to say before before we move forward, and, and I, I I'm glad that it's not considered unsatisfactory. But the same way, I, I, when I go to the Pillion schools, I don't consider them below average either. The report card is a really flawed measure of student success and, and academic achievement at a school. And so that that, that there's to, to me there's absolutely no doubt about it. There again, uh, Dr. Phillips, what is your degree in? And did you understand the growth measure, did you say? We have no idea what the growth measure It's those kinds of things. If you can't explain it, well, you got a problem. So we have some real issues when it comes to, when it comes to our, our accountability model. And we're working. Uh, I've talked to, to multiple state representatives about the accountability model. What we want is an accountability model that appropriately and correctly reflects the type of learning that's taking place in a school. I'd walk through your school. I knew what was taking place in the school. I was 100% confident in that, the same way I am in, in the three billion schools about what's taking place. So I, I would tell you uh, congratulations on a great year. I know it's going to be another great year. There's a lot of uh, wonderful things taking place at White Knoll. Um, the board, you're going to hear more about AVID. We'll, 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 do a, we'll do a session about AVID, about advancement via individual determination, a national model, uh, tremendous leverage on typically first-generation college students, uh, but students who haven't really reached their potential yet. And, uh, and so you're going to see a lot of that work out there in the White Knoll area to begin with, but that'll, that'll spread pretty quickly. Are we doing anybody else but White Knoll and, and Carolina Springs uh, at the Gilbert moment? Gilbert Middle School is exploring AVID this year as well. And Gilbert Middle. Okay, yes, so we'll, we'll, that'll, that'll start growing and, and moving. So, uh, but no, we, we certainly appreciate what you're doing, and we, we look very carefully uh, and plan with our schools about their data, and um, we're, we're going to continue to make progress. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. One Wait, question, Mr. Uh, Smith. Mr. Guy. Oh, Mr. Smith. One He's question. question. Just one question. Yeah. And congratulations on the, you know, the the achievement there. Um, if you could nail down, and not to put you on the spot, like nail down one or two things you think that made the most difference. What do you What do you think it was? Um, and and I think to Dr. Power's question to the the data that's in the report card, which I mean, generally, it's data we have anyway from, from test results and, and all of that, that particularly that our accountability folks share with us. Uh, but, but it did highlight some things. Uh, uh, some of the biggest differences, uh, to be quite honest, the, uh, the student engagement piece, uh, we, we didn't cheat on it, but we realized going into that survey the second year around, uh, we were not going to take that for granted. We, we spent some time uh, talking to our kids about student engagement before they did the survey, reminding parents the survey was coming up, just kind of making sure they understood why it was important. Uh, uh, we did take a hard look, and it actually happened before the report card at uh, ESOL students. Uh, we are, um, I believe, uh, uh, one of the schools with, with the, uh, the highest ESOL population, about 90, 90 of our kids, so about 10% of our students receive some kind of services in that regard. And, and we had not done a very good job of, of really identifying and making sure we were serving those students the, the best way we could. So we took a hard look at how we were serving them, changed some of that model, and, and also we were, were granted an additional teacher, which was extremely helpful. Uh, continuing to work on uh, 
the student engagement model and particularly the workshop model in language arts and math, uh, which was, again, not, not new after report card, but it was, uh, it just brought more attention to the fact that uh, we believe that was, was highly impactful model of, of instruction, uh, great pedagogy, and, and we just needed to stay the course and continue working hard with our current teachers and particularly with new teachers we bring on board to make sure they are, are, are implementing that model with fidelity. Good deal. It's exciting. You were here at the end of the school year and you and I talked about your plan and the fact that you've worked it so well and your teachers and your staff thank them for us because it's evident that you guys are working really, really hard. So it's evident with your students. Thank you. And we have a board visit there next Friday morning. I know. We're so excited. Oh, we like to see the where the rubber meets the road. So thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And uh, we have a um, well, one of our favorite topics here. Um, are we, we do uh, some, I think in August we had this conversation, or July. July. And at that time, uh, we we talked to the board, and I'll, I'll let I don't want to step on Mr. Caldwell's presentation, right but ahead, at that everyone time, everyone around me already has. Well, <laughs> we, we do want to. We did talk about it in October, bringing you back an update on some of the work that Mr. Caldwell's been doing, and here he is here tonight to have that conversation that. To, to walk us through what he's done. Now, uh, just as an aside, we're not making policy decisions tonight. What we want to show you are policy recommendations based upon the feedback that Mr. Caldwell's done. So I just want to make sure we're, we're understanding our expectations for tonight. So, uh, Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Little and Madam Chair, members of the board. And I'll begin with the end in mind. Not only are we making recommendations, I will end this with a request that you take this information over the next month and, and give us feedback as we prepare to possibly make amendments to a recently amended policy. So just as a reminder, if you back in, in May, we received a memo from the State Department telling us that the Youth Access to Tobacco Act of 2006 had been amended and with that required some changes to our policy. While I felt the, the changes were relatively minor, there was new language in the, in the uh, state models, so we um, and also the, the uh, governor mandated that we have that uh, done by August 1st. So that gave us the months of June and July to go through the two readings. So that's why it was kind of a hurried process, if you remember. There are three policies that this, uh, that this touches. It's the, the, the tobacco and nicotine-free school district, tobacco and nicotine-free workplace, and the tobacco and nicotine used by students. And also, if you remember, all three policies have the exact same language. So we made those uh, uh, amendments and made those changes and they were approved at the July 16th board meeting. And at that time, a request was made for me to have an October update and it's October. So what we did from July forward was to get stakeholder input that we normally would have gotten had we had an opportunity to do it, but we're in the summertime and in a very uh, tight time frame. So I met with Parent Advisory Council, I met with Student Advisory Council, I met with the Teacher Leadership Council, I got feedback from other members of the community, and basically we went through a protocol where I gave them the old policy, I gave them the new policy, I gave them just one copy, I gave them the student policy because again, they're all three the same language. And I asked them to partner, I asked them to read the, the policies, um, partner with someone at their table and tell us the things that they liked about the changes, the things that they didn't like about the changes or, or the wonders that they had and the hopes. So I did this three separate times and I actually had a, a member of the community actually go out to a PTO at one of, one of the schools and do this same uh, process. And so that landed me with about 127 sticky notes that I had that I spread out on my kitchen table and tried to find patterns and trends because there were one-off comments or, or things that, that really didn't apply. But what I looked for were patterns and trends. What were things that people were saying over and over that the students and the parents and the teachers were saying collectively? And we found uh, three or four definite trends. Uh, most of the uh, responses, the, the, the majority of the responses that were received were around the discipline infractions. If you will recall, there were lots of discipline and consequences we could have added with a new policy. Uh, we. Uh, elected to use just the one day out of school and the three day out of school um, uh, consequence, consequences. Uh, lots of folks said we, they, they would like to see the community service back in the policy as a consequence option. Interesting, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of, stu a lot of uh, 
participants thought that out of school suspension for the first offense was too harsh. I will tell you as an aside, we did have one response that said, I think the first offense should be a three day out of school suspension. And I think the second offense should be a recommendation for expulsion. I can't remember which school that student went to, but that was a student response. So the parents and the teachers were much more lenient and understanding of the therapeutic approach we're trying to take. Uh, uh, maybe that um, belies the fact that the student was very fed up with going to the uh, restroom and it becoming a vaping lounge. Uh, a lot of folks also said if, you, if cessation program, if, if education is good after the second offense, well, why isn't it good after the first offense? Um, another thing that, that came up was about staff infractions because, again, there are one of these policies deals uh, specifically with staff. Uh, that was the second most frequent uh, uh, policy that was commented or a portion of the policy that was commented. Uh, they wanted a, uh, lots of folks wanted a specific order of the staff consequences. While they are listed, they are not necessarily listed in the order of those consequences being imposed. And we will have further conversations with our HR friends to, to talk through that. Um, if it dealt with a, uh, an employee suspension, they wanted to know how long that suspension might be. And if, and we discussed this back in the summer, would nicotine patches be allowed? So those kind of questions bubbled up to the surface as we went through this process. Do we have any idea, like, what percent of our staff vapes? I do not. I mean, I've, I'll be honest, all the schools I've visited, I've never seen anybody <laughs> vaping at a, this well, a staff member. Uh, they're not supposed to be doing anything like that right. at school, but so I, I would right. have no idea. I just idea. wondered. Really that's don't interesting. Know. Uh, other, other questions that came up, that the cost of the cessation program, uh, the quality of enforcement, this came up a lot, but particularly in the student policy, how you're going to enforce it, and even more uh, specifically, how are you going to enforce it in the restrooms, in the bathrooms, because that seems to be the, the uh, place of choice. Uh, so I'll, I'll get back to that in just a moment. I just wanted to throw uh, at you just a few points of data. I can tell you, you can do a thesis. You can do a, a, a doctoral degree in, in vaping if you had the time and the energy to do it, and you can get lost in the data. And you can, if you put, if you Google vaping, and then you can spend the rest of the day, the week, the month looking at, at research and stats and that sort of thing. But uh, in Lexington 1, the, the, the tobacco violations, and that's in quotes because vaping currently is a tobacco offense, so it's listed in Power School as a tobacco violation. Uh, those violations more than doubled from the 17 18 school year to the 18 19 school year. And this year, of all the, this, Current year, 1920, about 95% of all of our tobacco violations are vaping. So cigarettes and dip and those kind of things are very much a thing of the past, and vaping is the is the tobacco offense uh, of choice. Nationwide, I found this kind of interesting. As of October the 4th, when I was wrapping up this uh, research, there had been, a, according to the Wall Street Journal, there had been over a thousand people hospitalized and 19 deaths related to vaping. The CDC, who, ups, who updates their data every Thursday, as of last Thursday, 1,299 lung injury cases and 26 confirmed deaths. So in four days, seven people died. Now, if you carry that math out, you can see that we're talking about truly an epidemic. In fact, it's so much of an epidemic, I found out just this weekend, and I received a copy of it yesterday from Dave Duff, uh, you know, one of our district's attorneys, there is a what the state of Washington, this district in Washington, is calling a class action suit. Dave refers to it as a multi-plaintiff suit. But they've started that in the state of Washington. One very small school district uh, has filed an 80-page complaint. And Dave has been contacted by an out-of-state attorney asking if we would be interested in joining the complaint. So that is, that is new as of yesterday afternoon. So we really don't know where that's going, but I do uh, tell you that if this is not a Lexington One problem, it's not a South Carolina problem. This was the, a, a 600 student district in Washington State that began this process. But nonetheless, um, 26 deaths as of October the, the 8th. Well, and I think DHEC is gonna be speaking to this at some point at the state level. Um, you know, we required by law to report certain communicable diseases and they're actively requesting for vaping associated lung disease deaths in the state. 
um, cause I challenged, you know, this is not on the list and they responded back. Uh, they're considering it a, um, a state crisis. So well, anything they consider, then they can require us to report. So that's right. That's exactly right. And it, it is such a thing now. And, and Mr. Anderson shared this with me earlier today. Uh, DHEC now has its own name and I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's E V A L I Evali e-cigarette and vaping product use associated lung industry. So it's, it has become its own category. In fact, juuling, the, the word jewel is now a verb instead of a noun. Uh, jewel owns 70% of the market share. Uh, they are apparently still building a, a facility in our backyard, but they currently have, uh, they've become a $10 billion industry. They did it in a matter of months, in fact, four times faster than Facebook, but people always look at Facebook as the, the, the company that just skyrocketed. Well, in, in, from, in three years' existence, they have become a 10 billion, with a B, dollar industry, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. Uh, some of the safety concerns, and, and I, I present this for two reasons. One, to, to kind of just remind you of, uh, and again, this merely scratches the surface, but it just reminds you, the board, and us uh, uh, as an SLT and as a district of the safety concerns. And it also reminds us that these are the kind of things we probably need, in, in fact, not probably, we need to do a better job of educating our, our students and educating our, our parents and our uh, staff about this because I don't know that they understand uh, the depth and the breadth of this problem just yet. Uh, most e-cigarettes, e as we know, contain nicotine. We also worry about the, the other pods that they can put in those that may have illegal substances. Uh, in fact, 99% of the e-cigarettes sold uh, do contain nicotine, although oftentimes they don't advertise. They don't, they don't say on the packaging that they do contain nicotine. And we also know about the berry flavors and the mangoes and the watermelons and those kind of things, although they swear that they did not intend to market this to children and they've apologized profusely. Um, they haven't stopped doing those kind of things. Um, and uh, research tells us that uh, nicotine can harm the developing adolescent brain and it keeps developing until about age 25. And we're looking at a, at a demographic of 12 to 17, 12 to 18 year olds in our schools that are, that are mainly the users. More safety concerns, and, and I don't have to read all this for you, but we, we know that it affects uh, nicotine can uh, affect the uh, attention span, learning, mood, impulse control. Um, it actually rewires the brain uh, when those uh, synapses are being formed, and it also increases the risk for future addiction to other drugs. It certainly increases the risk of addiction to nicotine, which Jeff Caldwell believes is the purpose of the, the jeweling uh, to begin with. I think it was first marketed as a, an opportunity to quit smoking, it seems to have become apparent that it is an opportunity to get hooked on smoking. Uh, and with, and, and this, this train wreck is, doesn't seem to have an end in sight. Uh, um, we talk about the, the vaping. Well, it, and vape, it's not really a water vapor. There is no water in these, in these mechanisms. It's an aerosol. Well, the, the name in itself, it, it just lends itself to something that's not good for you. If my wife took her hairspray and sprayed it in my face, which she may have done before, it is not, uh, is, is not a good thing. Uh, it has the, the, uh, the substances in this, in this aerosol that bystanders can uh, be um, affected by also. It contains nicotine, particles that can be held, uh, inhaled into the lungs, the flavoring, and I don't know if that's diacetyl, di, di, I don't know how to pronounce that word, uh, but it's a chemical linked to serious lung disease. There's uh, organic comp pounds, cancer-causing chemicals, obviously the folks are dying from something. And one person commented to me that, well, you know, folks die from cigarettes uh, all, all the time. Well, they do after smoking 40 years. These folks are dying after smoking for, for weeks and months or just a few years. So, uh, again, more, more information about the aerosol that uh, is harmful not only to the user but to bystanders. And we often just don't know what's in those, uh, in those pods. So next steps, um, the, we certainly need to increase our uh, student and uh, parent awareness of the dangers of vaping. That's why I've, you know, listing out some of the safety concerns as a reminder to all of us to do a better job with that. 
Uh, I've already talked to Mary Beth and her office about putting some links to um, uh, the CDC and other sites on our district's website. That is a plethora of information if parents will take and, and students will take the time to look at that. Um, we are uh, to planning on hosting programs to highlight the dangers of vaping. In fact, one is happening next week. You should have received an invitation to that. If you haven't, you're officially invited now. Uh, it's called Vaping Addiction, a Mother and Son Experience. It's a young man, I think, from North Carolina who is a school-age student, a high school-age student, who tells his story of the three or four times he's gone through rehab because of vaping. that's a White Knoll High program. It's a White Knoll High School mm -hmm. next, I, th I think that's Thursday, the 21st at 6.30, if I'm not mistaken. Um, one thing that's, that's come up in conversation is the feasibility of vape detection devices for school restrooms. That is something that we could look into. I will tell you what I've seen so far. Uh, those devices cost about $1,000 a piece. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a yearly uh, you know, maintenance cost and that sort of thing. A very, very rough estimate. We have about 225 bathrooms or so in our uh, middle and high schools. So you know, should we do something like that? Uh, if, if we wanted to go down that road, then we're talking about a significant... I was listening to a radio program yesterday about vaping, and they were talking about that those detection devices are really good. They didn't, they didn't mention the cost. But hopefully, as the demand grows, that more people will make them and the cost will go down. But do, do teachers seem to sense that it is a bathroom issue? They go in the bathrooms and vape? Absolutely. In okay. fact, it's kind of become a joke, but uh, people have commented, and Mr. Salters has heard his own children say, you know, I went to a vaping lounge and someone put toilets in there. Um, just so that's not a, a Lexington one thing or a, a particular high school thing, the lawsuit that uh, was uh, issued by the district in uh, Washington State said the same thing. They actually had pictures, and that, that, so, they, so that, that, that trend, that thought is, is nationwide that the bathroom is the number one spot where those kind of things happen. So. That's right, that, and what Mayor Beth was saying, the Student Advisory Council hammered us on it uh, about the, uh, you know, walking into this cloud of, of vapor. Uh, so in the, in the meantime, we certainly need to increase our, the visibility of our administrators and other staffs in the restrooms and uh, other areas. When I said other high incident locations, I don't really know what the other incident locations are uh, because it's mainly a bathroom issue. Um, but, uh, you know, the, we just need to be more visible and, and more diligent in trying to not necessarily catch the kids, but we're trying to eradicate a problem, if at all possible. So when I looked at all the feedback and I laid it out on my kitchen table and, and, and then talked with the other folks and they offered suggestions, uh, a few of these are really kind of clerical in nature. There was some clarification of some of the language. We may have only had the word possession and we needed to have the word possession and use just to be very clear in some of the language. Um, add the language that uh, the administrators will not only confiscate the uh, items, but they will not return them. I think that was kind of um, implied, but we want to be emphatic that we're going to take it from you and you're not getting it back. Um, add community service, as I mentioned earlier, back uh, as a consequence option, and edit the tobacco industry language. That's the, the paragraph that says we will not accept money from the tobacco industry. Again, imply that we would not accept money from the e-cigarette uh, industry, but we want to be more clear and just kind of uh, change that. Probably the biggest uh, recommended change is to, uh, again, folks overwhelmingly said we don't particularly like OSS first offense, and we don't know why you're waiting until um, second offense to do the education program. So we thought that we would suggest uh, merging the two. So the first offense, instead of an out-of-school suspension, would be an in-school suspension. And while in in-school suspension, complete an online tobacco slash vaping cessation program. Uh, there's lots out there. We're currently reviewing some of those with our friends from Loredac and other places. So I think um, if we went that route, we, we could certainly, in fact, we got an email just today. Uh, Dr. Talley forwarded to me that uh, there's been some research and some, and some education programs that are being made available. Um, to uh, to the schools, so we would we could spend the next couple of months if we chose to do that to be sure that we have a program that would that would meet those needs. And, and that education uh, needs to show a video of someone dying of this. It's kind of like the crystal meth discussion. I mean, those mm -hmm. pictures of people have used crystal meth in a year or two years. I mean, that gets 
that has incredible street oh, yeah, traction. Like the before so, and after pictures. Yeah, so, so right. part yeah. of that education needs to be someone who's dying from an associated, a vaping associated lung disease. Um, and I mean, I don't know, I'm sure someone's willing to do that for us to okay. provide that footage. For sure, us. absolutely. That, that's right. That's right. right. Like those old scared straight programs. Oh, absolutely. Um, I yeah. think those are effective. Yeah. Um, and I would just, because I attended the um, drug and alcohol task force today, and mm -hmm. Laredax presentation on vaping was excellent. Um, and I think one of the things about the cessation program, and I'm sure that this is part of your research, is I think it's very important that the um, cessation program that we require um, is targeted towards vaping. Because one of the problems is these students don't realize that vaping products contain nicotine. I mean, they, they think they're jeweling, you know, cotton candy vapor. That's I right. mean, they really do. And so I think we need to make sure that it's tailored towards, um, if it's tobacco, they're going to tune out um, because they don't think that applies to well, them. And, and to that point, it, it could probably be exclusively vaping because 95% yes. of, uh, of the offenses now are vaping as we sit. So, um, so absolutely, it would need to be, if not exclusively, certainly heavy into vaping. And, and the more graphic and the more real we can make it, then the better off we, we can be. We could just make it all the students wear scarlet V's for vaping. I'm just kidding. I'm uh, just kidding. Well, I'm, you know, <laughs> a little bit of public humiliation can go a long way. To the old scared straight thing, I mean, I think that because vaping can be done so quietly and so inconspicuously in the bathroom, I mean, parents, teachers, nobody, will, I don't know how you police it. Um, and so anything that we can do to, you know, let the to create a stigma around it, um, obviously not a scarlet V, but um, anything that we can help these students understand just how serious the decision is to vape. One of the things that I read, it's not in this presentation because I'm actually at the end, uh, is that in 1997, if I go back that, to that time frame, about 35% of students in, in our high school age bracket uh, admitted to smoking. By 2017, it was down to about 7%. So that, that war, if you will, that battle and that uh, creating that stigma and that, uh, that public health problem with uh, smoking almost was eliminated. And in one year's time, some of the research I've read said, we've reversed that trend in one year's time through vaping. And, the, and you know, safer doesn't mean safe. And you're right, the, the students just don't understand what it is they're doing. Uh, so the last next step that I have here is, is a respectful request that, that you as a school board really study this information and any other information that you find and, and offer input to me and to SLT over this next month. So when we come back uh, in November, uh, then maybe we're, we're ahead of the game and we will have some, some real quality amendments to make to the policy. Um, and uh, for first reading at, at the November board meeting. With that, I will open it up to any questions you may have. The only thing is you said remove the education from the second offense. Again, I think education after each offense, because uh, it's not bad they go through the same material. Well, uh, and, and to that point, the reason I had to remove it is because we were doing it at the first one. That's not to say we it couldn't be, there could be a, a more robust education program after the first offense, or after the second offense, I mean, yeah. 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 Mr. Cole, do you know where, um, this might be a question for Dr. Talley, where in our curriculum, I know in like the health class in high school, the, uh, there's a vaping unit about two thirds of the way through. Does that um, uh, lesson, the, do those vaping lessons live anywhere else other than just our health classes? I, I do not know the answer to that. I will find that out, but I don't know that. I mean, I just, I wonder if we need I, I to do, to be more aggressive do. in putting this um, education about vaping in front of the students, whether it's in their crew, mm -hmm. for the class, for mm -hmm. the schools that have crew, um, you know, when you're talking about the... Well, definitely in middle school. That yeah. same um, <clears throat> uh, radio thing I was listening to, she, the main lady said she sees them all the time at 12. She said they really come in and they're so addicted at 12 years old. And what you were saying about the um, cigarette smoking, the decrease that we saw decline. Um, I mean, my children that came through elementary school, you know, 
2005 through 2011 when the anti-smoking thing was such a, a significant part of their health classes. I mean, they thought that smoking was the absolute worst possible thing you could ever do. Um, and, you know, I think that we need to have that sort of aggressive education, even into the middle school, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, um, where they can't avoid getting that message. Um, I think that needs to be one of our priorities is to, to push that information out just as, as hard as we can. I agree with that, and I think one of the, the unspoken things is, is yet again, we've not caught up to the trend. And, and by the time we do, in fact, there's probably something already out there that we just don't know about. So if we, we get a good handle on, on vaping and then maybe something else comes along, I wish we could stay out in front of that. But I think to your point, the education probably is very tobacco and cigarette heavy because that's been our, our thing for 50 years. And now all of a sudden, out of the darkness comes this, this device and we just you know, weren't prepared to to handle it, but, but we will be. Any other questions? I have a question. You said tobacco violations more than doubled from 1718 to 1819. Are we talking 80% or 55%? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the. I'm just kind of curious, on one of those slides, you said that the violations have more than doubled. So if, if, it were, if it were 300, the year before, it was over 600 this, the, the next year. Okay, so I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, okay, I'm I don't, just wondering. I don't have way. the numbers in my head. Okay, I was but it was, uh, it was let's say, 250 uh, in 1718 and maybe over 500 in 1819. Okay. Don't, please, if you wouldn't quote me exactly on those numbers, uh, but it was, that's what it was. It was more than, more than twice as much. Okay, thank you. So... That's, that's a very good suggestion, and, and we will certainly, like I said, we just today there was a, we have a, a drug task force that the district is a part of, and uh, through RADAC, and so that certainly if there there I'm sure it would be something like that or something we could develop on our own to do that. So that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. So a couple observations um, since since we talked about this in July, um, the, the trend uh, has gone one in five for for high school students to one in four, to now we're approaching one in three. Um, for use. For use. Mm -hmm. um, and that's felt to probably be a conservative number. Um, and so we're talking, you know, we're approaching, and, and again, of that, an uh, important figure to remember is that one third of those also go on to put something else in their body. Um, so 33% yeah, of 33%, that's, that's a big number. Um, <laughs> which amazes me that, that we're surprised that superheating um, a chemical causes problems. I mean, we live in a world where we're worried about heating up a, a microwave plastic because it's got a BPA in it, and we're surprised that we're getting sick from this. So that, that, I find that shocking. Um, secondly, we didn't have illness and death three months ago. Um, now we do. Um, so you're seeing a much more captive audience. And, and I've actually even seen that within my office. So I have now seen multiple patients who have come in who are terrified that something is wrong with their lungs now. Um, and, you know, they've come in and said, I've stopped vaping, you know, but I, I'm just, I'm a nervous wreck. I'm a nervous wreck. And so there is very much a captive audience now um, because of the, the national media, because of, of the, the stance that is being taken, we have a very captive audience right now. And so, you know, the, the time to act is, is now. Um, I have personally completely changed my approach and how I approach vaping in my office. Um, it's not, do you vape? It's, when did you last vape? Um, one little secret I'll give you all. When you go to your doctor and they ask you how many glasses of wine you have a day, we double it. All right. So when y'all say, when y'all say, no, nah, I just drink two glasses of wine a night. Oh, no, she's drinking four. Um, so it's, it's an understood 
that you're going to probably marginalize a little bit of that. So we, we, we factor in some of that. Um, so that's caused me to change my approach to now, when's the last time you vaped? Um, because one out of three, one out of two times, I'm probably going to be right. Um, and secondly, in my, I guess, coaching of this, you know, I, I think we, we live in a world now where seeking the truth is, is one of the noblest acts you can do. And so we see a lot of truth seekers right now, especially within the young population. They are seeking truth. They are seeking truth. And so my approach to them is you are being lied to and you have fell for it hook, line, and sinker. You have been told to lie that this is safer. Well, guess what? People are dying. You have been told that, oh, we would never go after, you know, the, the younger groups. Well, why do you think they're hiring social media influencers? Where do you spend most of your time on social media? Um, and so, you know, you've basically been reduced to a profit line, a profit loss statement. And, and that's kind of what I'm telling parents. Remember, your child is now a line on a business's profit and loss statement. And it's sad. It's, it, it should cause that, that righteous indignation that, that should just, just exist at the parent, teacher, administrator, community level. And that's, that's exactly what it is. That, that lawsuit, and again, it's 80 pages long, so I haven't read all 80 pages. But it talks about Jewel and their 70% market share. It also talks about another company, starts with an A. I don't remember what the name is. But the FDA came down on that, on that company. And as a result, it, it apologized profusely for uh, you know, marketing to, to kids. It admitted that the, the student use was epidemic. Um, it denounced Jewel and all of the things that they were doing. I mean, it really just kind of took the high road and, and made a pledge that forevermore, we're going to do a better job of, uh, you know, we're going to market to the adults and leave the kids out of it. And I'm, I, they said it much more eloquently than that, obviously. That was in October. In December, that same company invested $12.8 billion in Jewel. The same company that denounced them, that said they were the evil empire, now owns 35% of that company. They also have the, the largest market share of Marlboro, which is the number one cigarette cigarette. So they, they got you coming and going. Yeah, and, I was, and it I is was, about the bottom line. I actually got a, an update this week from somebody told me, Juuling's out. We, we don't jewel anymore. There's some cheaper options out there. We go with these different pods. Uh, There's a new pod, apparently, that's being used or something along those lines. So nobody jewels anymore, is what I was told. And it's like, well... I'm just now catching up to the jeweling thing. I mean, <laughs> right, right. No. Yep. And they fashion their marketing and their device and their their bottom line after big tobacco. That they're using tactics that big tobacco through their settlements couldn't use, but they had access to thousands and thousands of documents, and they have they have their their business plan is fashioned after big tobacco with no, uh, you know, with no restraints. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Caldwell. Um, so we'll be bringing you some more information. We'll have that to you um, and uh, just some feedback. And, and we'll work on November and December uh, to, to finalizing that policy and also looking into some educational programs as well. I know that's one of the things that will be on our list. Um, so finally, we have, uh, or almost finally tonight, we have uh, a, a what often happens to Mr. Salters as he uh, ends up batting cleanup and uh, sharing with us some things. So, uh, Mr. Salters. Uh, thank you, Dr. Little. Uh, briefly tonight, I have some uh, pictures of the construction going on in our um, bond referendum program. Uh, and I start out at Centerville Elementary School tonight. Uh, as you recall, at, uh, Centerville um, is being built. Uh, we, we have plans and was approved in the um, facilities plan to um, close uh, or, or retire the name of Gilbert Primary School. Um, move Gilbert Elementary School back to Gilbert Primary's location, which was originally Gilbert Elementary School, if you follow that. Um, so the Gilbert Elementary School will become a K-5 school again. Uh, Centerville will be the other K-5 school in the area, so we'll have two full uh, elementary schools. Uh, so we're pleased with the progress going on out here at Centerville. Um, this is a shot, really Highway 1 would be in the lower portion of your um, your view and so um, 
we, we have, you can see the entrance driveway is kind of taking shape here. Uh, we've got all of our uh, foundation block in. Um, we have uh, the, the walls um, are up to bearing height here on the, um, the back classroom wing there. And we've had a, a, a concrete pour, a big concrete pour um, in the cafeteria fine arts area. Um, and we have uh, some of the parking lot lay down is actually already already done here as well. So um, they're moving along nicely. As you recall, the school is, is slated to open in August um, of this next year. So um, it may not look like it will, but it will. Um, and we've been very fortunate with the, um, the weather um, we, we, over the last uh, really four to six months. Um, we've um, the, the drought is not good for the community, but it is good for uh, the construction uh, of, of our facilities. So um, we are we are making good good progress. Um, this is and just a shot of the cafeteria area. That would be the loading dock there on the on the left side. But um, good progress there at Centerville. Moving on to uh, Pillion Middle School. Um, again, just a reminder: uh, Centerville is a prototype of the original Rocky Creek Elementary School plan, and then Meadow Glen and Deerfield. Um, Pillion Middle School is a prototype of Beechwood, um, and uh, very pleased with the progress going on at at, at Pillion. I've kind of joked with that contractor that they're going to they have a two year build, but they're going to squeeze it all into a year and end up beating the uh, Centerville uh, opening. It seems like they're really moving fast out there. Um, you remember what Beechwood looks like, so you can kind of see it taking shape. These are the classroom wings here on the left. Uh, your cafeteria space is in the, in the back. The kitchen, they're ready for a pour there. Um, you've got the crane here that's actually uh, setting steel and decking uh, on the back classroom wing. We've actually got second floor door frames set um, and, and masonry going up on the second floor on the A wing there. Um, and then the foundations are laid out um, at, at – Pillion, we flipped the um, auditorium and, and uh, gymnasium space, um, and so this is the auditorium here. The gymnasium's in the front. The main office area is, you know, still located here as well. So um, really good, good progress out there. Um, the soil conditions are very conducive to, you know, working even when it's it's wet. We did have a, a, a small shower uh, the other night, um, calling for some more rain this evening that we hope we get. Um, so you can see we're really coming along uh, on this project as well. Um, they have poured uh, or will have poured the kitchen by the by next week. Um, all of that and rough end is, is taking place, and that's a big deal. There's a lot of stuff going on in that kitchen uh, space that, that they have to prepare for. When we went to the meeting in Swansea the other night, I rode by there, and, I, I mean, it looks like a school. I mean, oh, yeah. there's no – it doesn't look like framing or – it, I could definitely see the school. It's so exciting. Yeah, you can really, really see the the, the shape coming up, and it's it's nice to have already seen it, what it looks like at, in the end, and so having Beechwood built, so you can kind of get a real good perspective of it. Uh, Carolina Springs Elementary School, just briefly, this is um, we have a storage building. One of the projects in the referendum is to, to put a, a, a number of storage buildings around the district, and um, they're very excited about this building, um, and uh, it's located in the back near the uh, kitchen area. And it, it will be, it will have a brick uh, veneer finish to, to match the school uh, and roofing. So, really excited to get that up. Um, and then just uh, the, the last pictures of, of these campuses for a little while, but just want to highlight the fact that we, um, you know, last month we had some still roofing um, that was going on. And you can see the, the new roofs, it's pretty obvious. Um, all the, the cap sheet and everything has been finished there. Uh, so we're real pleased with uh, that progress at, at Lexington High School. That that is is now completed, um, and of course they continue to enjoy um, their new parking lot surfaces there at Lexington High School. Um, as always, you can check the the progress of our building plan um, at the website. I really appreciate the communications department uh, working with us and getting those pictures up and um, keeping track of that for us, uh, so our community can can see these projects firsthand. So. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about those. I just want to say thank you again for you and the whole team because, again, it's amazing all that we're juggling. And, I mean, we take it in stride and we can focus as a board on instruction, which ultimately mm -hmm. is our goal. Um, but, obviously, if you don't have the physical plant to support instruction, you can't even talk about instruction. So thank you again. Absolutely. Well, we've got uh, several of the guys here. Uh, you know, John and Matt do a tremendous job 
keeping us on schedule and, and um, keeping our architects and contractors um, moving forward. So we're really, really pleased with the work. No retiring in anyone's future, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> we have that conversation occasionally. <laughs>